When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Kitties, come in out of that wretched wetness. A weather like this is, ugh, well, let's just say I'd prefer to keep my fur dry by the fire. Thank you very much. Now, let me take your coat and help yourself to tonight's tea. It's a simple hot pot of Irish coffee. Perfect for a cold, wet night like this, wouldn't you say? No, oh, shut up about the caffeine. There's enough booze in there to knock out a rhino. Now, I'm your host, Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter, and you've arrived just in time. See, I was getting bored and would love to tell someone a story. And well, here you are. <laughs> oh, sure, you could go back out there into the rain and thunder where dark things lurk and wait. Oh, yes. At night, my valley is full of creatures that lurk in the shadows, stalking, hunting, herding you towards a set destination. Do you think you can outrun them? Really? This is their territory, their hunting grounds. Do you think you can outsmart them? Really? They've been doing this for millennia. Stalking. Hunting. Herding. Chasing you to a final destination where you will most likely find your doom. Though some enlightened minds might find their salvation and still others in sanity's elation. Oh, you felt like you were being chased on your way here. Heard it, perhaps? Well, what perfect serendipitous fortune. What a coincidence, because it looks like, until morning at least, when they all go to sleep, you will be my captive audience. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm a good host. <laughs> no, tonight's story is a bit of a lengthy yarn, so it might take a couple sessions to tell it. But do not fear, it's a good one. See, there is a theory one tale spinners have worked with many times before, that there are other worlds than these. Worlds that are different, yet similar. Worlds you might even be able to get to if you want, but most often you simply stumble upon them when you're least expecting it and least prepared. Sometimes all it takes to find these worlds is to get lost on the Black Paths. The Back Paths series by M59 Gar, otherwise known as Matt Dimersky. First half, part one, The Back Path. I'd just made a trip to the grocery store when I found out. Pulling into my space in the carport between the rows, I couldn't help but stare at the two police cars and gathered crowd of concerned onlookers. Grabbing some of my groceries, I began carrying them into my apartment, pausing each trip to look across the carport and try and discern what had happened. Hey, 
I said to my disheveled metalhead neighbor. What happened? He closed his gaping mouth and looked over at me from next to his car. That, uh, lady freaking out? That's the mom. The mom? He furrowed his brow. Kids disappeared. Little girl, seven years old. The one always screaming out here with her friends, I think. They're handing out pictures. A sinking feeling filled my chest. I focused on grabbing some grocery bags from my trunk to keep my composure. That's terrible. Yeah. Said she was playing with other kids around the 500s. I looked up the stairs at my door's hanging number, 840. That would put the incident in the opposite corner of the apartment complex. Not sure what else to say, I slammed my trunk shut and carried the last of my things inside. Things like this happen from time to time, surely. But in my very own neighborhood? To a family right across the carport? The sense of violation left me shaken. After a few stressful minutes inside, I decided to go for a run to clear my head. Leaving the opposite direction to avoid the crowd in the carport out back, I turned and headed out, running along the high barbed fence marking the edge of our development. Nice enough houses and a few forested areas passed by outside, but nothing that seemed dangerous and I saw no holes in the fence or other paths through. Racking my brain, trying to remember if I'd seen anything suspicious or anyone unfamiliar, I turned toward the interior of the complex, running past the outer rows of apartments. I passed through the small gap in the carport wall, entering the back paths. The back paths were beautiful and well-kept. Lane brick sidewalks lined with trees forming a maze that twisted and turned between every building. The summer sun remained distant through the foliage, keeping the shaded paths cool and refreshing. I paused for a breath at a picnic table placed at an angle before two large bushes, not sure exactly where I was. No numbers were visible along the back side of the apartment buildings. I walked back and forth while I caught my breath, but only smooth, unbroken aluminum siding remained visible behind the thick trees. The back paths were a favorite place of mine to run, always empty, cool, and solitary. But I'd lost my way while distracted. A light breeze shifted the trees overhead, an unexpected, humid, and unpleasant chill. Looking down one path, I saw only endless sidewalk curving off into the tree-lined paths, shot through by dappled sunlight. Down the other lay a picnic table by two large bushes and a circular basin framing planted flowers. Walking over in confusion, I studied the picnic table. Was it the same one I'd just stopped at? They all looked the same, I supposed, but I didn't remember the sidewalk circling around flowers. I would certainly have noticed their bright purple, right? That strange, chilly breeze came again. Strong enough to ruffle my clothes. I narrowed my eyes to test my vision, wondering if the area was growing darker. As I picked a direction and ran, my suspicions were confirmed. The first drop of water hit my shoulder, making me jump and look around. But of course, nobody was there. Except the quiet now felt strange, almost curved, as if someone was nearby just around the corner or walking along a nearby path. The presence felt aloof, like uninterested passerby on their way to somewhere. 
But I still had an inexplicable urge to remain quiet. Walking quietly, taking care to avoid the stray nuts and leaves on the brick path, I listened intently to my lightly ragged breathing and the increasing drizzle on the leaves overhead. Turning at a bend once more, I came to another picnic table. A square basin held a large patch of dark green ivy. How the hell had I missed the exit? Any exit. There had to be gaps in, to the different carports everywhere. I, I must have just missed the last one somehow. Maybe bushes had grown over it, and so distracted, I walked right by. The rain finally passed the leafy canopy overhead, dripping regularly down on me. Now a little scared and more than a little frustrated, I took off running as fast as I could, bolting down the green-lined pathways. As the noise of crushed nuts and crinkled leaves radiated from under my pounding feet, the sound of scraping metal echoed back. The presence I'd felt before seemed to snap to attention. Now anything but uninterested, the high squeal of metal faded, replaced by rapid footfalls. Spurned on by a surge in the rain covering my noises, I turned, ran, turned, ran again. Bushes, trees, brick, and smooth aluminum siding blurred past me, never opening, never offering escape. The heavy footfalls grew closer, less than one angled curve behind me. Suddenly, coming up short, I slid along the slick sidewalk, my legs shooting forward, the harsh sidewalk scraping right up my thigh. The stop had been worth it. A gap in the brick to my left opened on a car-filled lot. Finally, I shook my head, almost laughing. I'd just gotten lost in the back paths and freaked myself out with all sorts of imagined fears and... came around the corner slowly, that high metal squeal rising again. My entire awareness seemed to freeze, refusing to take in the rotting thing lumbering down the path toward me, misshapen and grotesque. The very act of motion seemed to send visible waves of pain across a twisted face that ran half the length of its body, ending at broken teeth set in its waist. Black gore seeped from open stumps where the left half of its vaguely human body should have been, but it continued shambling, as if the limbs were there, Somehow supported in impossible ways, the metal squeal came again, sharp steel on stone. But I could see no source for the sound. I had the distinct impression that what I was not seeing was far more horrific and dangerous than what I was seeing. Grasping stone... Shouting hoarsely at the top of my lungs, I recovered as fast as I could. Scrambling for the gap in the brick, I darted behind a van, slowing as I realized that the rain had suddenly stopped. The sun was shining overhead, and the hot day felt as normal as any other. Peering around the edge of the van, I watched the gap to the back paths, but nothing showed. Taking a moment to catch my breath, I finally had a chance to analyze the last sound I'd heard, a distant noise following my shout, the terrified scream of a little girl. She was in there. She was. I stared at the gap, the terrible thought really hitting home. In there. 
Running back to my apartment, I sighted the police still at the mother's house and the onlookers still hanging around talking in hushed tones. Geez, what happened to you, dude? My neighbor asked, still standing outside his apartment. Running a hand down my face to slick off the rain, my clothes were still soaked. I realized I couldn't tell the police. What would I say? Some horrific aspect had come out of the back paths of the apartment complex? I would look like a madman, and the focus would almost certainly turn on me, and I couldn't risk that, because I was the only one who knew where she was. I just stared at him for a moment, profoundly unhappy. I had to go back in there. Someone's stupid sprinkler, I finally said, turning to head inside and change. A half step into it, I paused. Whether it was real or whether I was losing my mind, another perspective would be very useful. I turned back to him. Hey, man. What are you doing right now? Uh, nothing. What's up? I considered not telling him but it would be brutal to trick him into going into that horrible place, especially when my instinct was telling me that what I'd experienced was only the tip of the iceberg. There was another option. He might actually believe me, provided he was in the right state of mind. You high right now? He laughed and smoothed down his t-shirt, glancing over the cop cars. Yeah, of course. I gulped. Good. I think I know where that little girl is. Part 2 Running the Maze A searing lance of sunset fire framed the evening sky in slow motion, lending everything the subdued color of flame. I pulled the car into my spot and killed the engine, watching the gap to the back paths. I imagined it was glaring back at me, the shadows beyond wavering strangely in the dim orange twilight. My neighbor, Mike, carried a large spool of electrical wire close to his rumpled black Megadeth t-shirt. How come you get the sledgehammer? Getting out and pulling the heavy tool from the back seat, I ripped the barcode sticker off and hefted it in both hands, Not wanting to give any of my plans away, I gave him no answer. He followed anyway, probably still uncertain whether I was serious. Tie one end around this bush, I said, indicating the plant immediately outside the gap. As he did so, I briefly rested the sledgehammer on the ground and pulled my jacket tighter. There's not a cloud in the sky he said, billowing his t-shirt with one hand and sweating slightly from the heat. I narrowed my eyes. You should really wear a jacket. Fine, man. Fine. He turned to walk back to his apartment. I stood there waiting, unsure if he was going to return. The fire in the sky lost some of its glow with each passing minute, leaving the bit of back path I could see increasingly shrouded in gloom. Finally, he came back, walking up with a windbreaker open and flapping, and his hands in his pockets. His eyes were a little more bloodshot than before. Shrugging, I hefted the sledgehammer and led the way through the gap the canopy overhead and the framing high walls immediately brought heavy silence and orange cast murkiness. Mike held the spool, unwinding it as he walked, 
At random intervals, he laughed quietly to himself. Quiet! I whispered harshly. There's something in here, remember? He chuckled and blinked heavily. Looks the same as ever to me, man. And it did. The brick path stretched away in either direction, following the back sides of the apartment buildings. We came to the first picnic bench, flanked by two bushes. Looking around, ensuring we were alone, I took out my pocket knife and cut a letter on the unseen bottom side of the table. Walking further, we came to another gap in the brick wall, finding ourselves at another carport in the development. Doesn't seem weird to me, he said apologetically. Not sure what to do, I led us both back to the picnic table. The letter I'd carved remained underneath. I've run through here a thousand times, I said, studying the paths. I wasn't paying attention when it happened. Maybe that's the key. He made a confused face. How do we not pay attention when we know we're trying not to pay attention? We sat for a moment at a loss, until I had a thought. Close your eyes and walk? He shrugged, and we moved to the corner, facing down a long straightaway that led deeper into the back paths. Closing my eyes, I stepped forward slowed only slightly by his hand gripping the tail end of my jacket. Carefully taking one step at a time, I clutched the sledgehammer close and put one hand out, anticipating a hedge or a tree at any moment. The evening air was unpleasantly warm and humid, even under the trees and I seemed to be reaching into hot, silent emptiness. My anticipation of the oncoming corner rose to a painful height, but still nothing met my fingers. As the sightless creeping wore on, I began counting my steps. Five, ten, fifty... When I reached a hundred, I was certain something was wrong. I finally opened my eyes. My outstretched hand hung less than an inch from a twisted, rusted blade. Jumping back into Mike, I stared at the blighted, misshapen antique street sign that had nearly sliced my hand in two. The words had been weather-worn beyond readability. What the hell? he asked, opening his eyes. We both looked around. The sidewalk and lining trees remained, but the visible walls beyond now ran with a strange style of stucco. I told you, I whispered, holding the sledgehammer higher. First things first. Let's follow this wire back, make sure we can get out. We might not be able to get out? He asked, worried. I winced. Um, well, I did last time. I'm sure we'll be fine. Except the wire we'd spooled out led right into a brick wall, disappearing into it right where the gap should have been. Holy shit, Mike said, dropping the spool. I regarded the brick unconcerned. I thought this might happen. Lifting the sledgehammer back, I brought it forward with all my strength. A large piece of brick fell out, and I hit it again, and then a third time, swinging until the single layer brick gave way. "'smashing out a large gap. "'We peered through. "'On the other side sat a parking lot full of cars. "'An almost manic smile crept upon my face. 
our return assured, Mike picked up the spool again and reluctantly followed me further into the back paths, down several long straightaways and through three four-way junctions. We found another picnic table, this one near a darkly shimmering pool of black water. I checked under the table, finding the symbol I'd carved, though what that meant I wasn't yet sure. Studying the little pool, little ripples told us of the light rain beginning overhead before either of us felt it firsthand. Told you we'd need jackets, I said, listening to the patter begin on the leaves overhead as the shade grew darker. The orange tint was gone, slowly replaced by the fuzzy, inky blue found only at the edge of true night. Peering down the paths as we walked, straining to see, we both jumped at shifting, malformed shadows that repeatedly turned out to be tricks of the eye. A crack of thunder resounded overhead, and the rain began dripping from the leaves overhead in earnest. Mike shivered and raised his hood. This sucks, man. We should go back. Before I had a chance to reply, we rounded a corner and came across a horrific sight. A mangled mass of flesh and black gore lay splattered across the sidewalk, a long trail of fleshy bits and smeared filth leading away into the direction we'd intended to go. The entire terrible display seemed to subtly shift and change in the eye-defying darkness. I even imagined I saw some of the creature's severed fingers still moving about in their puddle, but I chalked it up to the splattering rain. That's the thing I saw, I whispered, frozen in place. That's the thing? He whispered back. Then what did that to it? I shook my head. I think we need to risk one shout. What? He hissed, wiping rain water from his face. Are you crazy right now? The little girl responded last time I shouted. And we can't wander around here forever. He seemed terrified, but relented. Cautiously moving the opposite direction from the ravaged corpse, I gave one quick, hoarse yell. Hello? 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 The sound seemed to echo for nearly twenty seconds. We stood silent, hearts pounding. A small cry came from a path to our right. Running quickly and quietly in that direction, we stopped at a four-way intersection, not sure where to turn. A tapping sound below our feet, and we both jumped back in fright. It took a moment for us to realize that a pair of small eyes was watching us from below a sewer grate. It took another moment for us to grip the grate through inch-deep rivulets of pouring rain and throw it to the side. Mike pulled her out from down below. It was the little girl he described, albeit covered in dirt and soaked to the bone. Screwing up her face in fear, she pointed behind us. We didn't waste any time looking. Mike scooped her up, and we took off running along the lane wire, splashing through ankle-deep water and trying not to lose the trail. I realized we would never be able to keep following the wire if the water grew any deeper. Wait! I hissed, stopping at a space of brick wall. We don't have to go all the way back to ours. Hefting the sledgehammer, I bashed the wall repeatedly, breaking pieces off with agonizing slowness. Heart pounding, I slammed again 
and again, trying to get through before... I sensed Mike and the girl tense. I turned. I blinked against the rain running down my face, peering into the shifting darkness along the path behind us. Lightning flashed, searing the scene in bright detail. But I saw nothing. Thunder rolled, and I turned away, hammering at the wall again. There! The little girl screamed. I looked back again, wearily lifting the hammer in case of attack. Eyes wide to soak in the barest light, still reaching us through the storm. I scanned the path, and still, nothing. One more swing sent a large section of the wall crumbling back, the knee-high water flowing through eagerly. Mike pushed the little girl through, then clambered through after her. Watching him squeeze through, I waited, senses on fire with adrenaline. Every raindrop and splash seemed to sear my ears, and every second seemed to stretch on eternally as I waited for Mike to finish getting through. I leapt around as I heard a different kind of splash before me. Staring around in terror, waiting for a flash of lightning to light up the path, I still saw nothing. Getting a sudden notion that there was a very obvious place for something to hide, I dropped the sledgehammer and left out of the thigh-high surging rainwater. Gripping branches, I climbed up into the closest tree, watching as another burst of lightning illuminated some grotesque series of shadows in the water below. The following thunder nearly shook me out of the tree, but I climbed higher, resolving to go right over the brick wall. Laughing loudly, I refused to fall from the slick branches, clawing my way upwards. I could see it, lit intermittently by eyeball-searing lightning. The top of the brick wall just out of reach, clambering up another branch, then a second and a third, I reached out a hand, and suddenly I was slipping, falling in panic. Though not the way I would have expected, my body seemed to tumble, my orientation shifting as I desperately grabbed at thick tree branches and came to a painful stop as one met my chest. Groaning, I dug my fingers into the nearby branches and tried to comprehend what I was seeing below. The lightning was now flashing intermittently under me. In the water? No. I was upside down. I clutched the tree harder as I realized it was the only thing between me and the infinite void of sky below. The storm clouds pulsed menacingly, blinking with bursts of light shaking the tree against me with riotous thunder and shooting waves of rain up at me. Confused and horrified, I looked up, seeing a ceiling of water still bubbling madly in, const in a constrained path, that impossible shape still moving underneath, waiting for me. The chilly, rain-soaked minutes passed, as I tried to think of a way out. I could climb up and get torn apart by that lurking horror, or I could let go and fall forever. I never felt quite that way before, feeling the certainty of death circling on all sides. Clinging to those branches, I thought about my life and everything I'd done, everything I'd wanted to do. Would it all end here in this otherworldly nightmare? A 
unless. Shivering, feeling my strength fading, I studied the wall next to me. It came down from above, stopping just out of reach. A crowning upside-down light fixture mocked my need for light with its broken bulb. Judging the distance by flashes of lightning, I guessed that I had only one way out. Doing my best to summon all my courage, I managed to make the wild split-second decision. Bracing my feet and edging as far forward as I dared, I leapt out toward the wall. Soaring through what I knew was endless void, my grasping hands found the light fixture, and I grappled desperately with it, curling and writhing in the air. With only a few seconds of grip on the rain-slicked metal, I let myself swing further forward, and I let go. I swung impossibly in the air, circling too fast to comprehend my orientation lost. A large, flat surface smacked into me bodily, knocking the wind from my lungs and bashing my face without compassion. Holy crap, man! How'd you do that? Mike shouted, running over to me. He waved his hand up the wall that was now properly above us, indicating what had probably been an insane and impossible acrobatic sight. Wiping dirt from my face, I sat up slowly, looking back in shock at the now normal gap to the back paths. The carport's lamps cast a slight illumination beyond, showing nothing but normal sidewalk. Gripping my head with one hand, I stumbled to my feet. I'm... I'm going home, I mumbled, glancing at the little girl who clung to Mike's leg. Take her home, will you? Don't tell anyone about this. He stared at me, like I was going to. Staggering toward my apartment, my soaked clothes slopping around me uncomfortably as I walked, I resolved to sleep for the next two days straight. Had anything I'd seen been real? What the hell was that place? I had the strangest feeling that the back paths and I had played a game, that it had been learning and adapting as we played and that I'd made it furious by escaping twice. It would react brutally if I entered a third time. I knew, but no matter. I was never going near those paths ever again. I reached my apartment with no small relief. Turning the key in the door, I opened it slightly and then paused. A white card had been nailed to my door with large red letters emblazoned across it. G-L-O-R-W-O-C Confused, I looked to my left and right, noticing the same card on each visible door. It was then I noticed the smell wafting from inside my apartment. A male yell of sheer terror rang out from across the card port. A shout of warning meant for me. Mike ran out between the cars holding the little girl, shouting something at the top of his lungs. I closed the door to my apartment softly, remaining outside. My tired gaze fell on my scraped up hands and legs. I laughed softly. <laughs> of course, 
Of course. And it had been my idea to try a different gap to escape. How foolish to assume all the gaps in that mind-bending nightmare exited to the same place. We weren't home. Not at all. We had to go back in. Now, wasn't that a fantastic tale? It seems our nameless protagonist is nobly leaping into the unknown for the sake of this little girl he doesn't even know. Of course, he's a resourceful chap, so we'll have to see how he fares in this strange alternate place. We'll continue that next time, however. Now, before you drift off, kitties... I've received some exciting news. This is for you and all of the other guests that visit this cabin. Oh, you cannot see them? Well, don't worry, they can see you just fine. See, one of the things about podcasts and shows like Twisted Tea Time is they don't go far without, well, support from the listeners. This typically comes in the form of reviews from iTunes. And I've just received my very first. So, here, there are two, and both of them are five stars. I, I am so flattered. <clears throat> Amazing. By Frozen underscore Chaos. Very well written stories, and even better narration. I get goosebumps and vivid images in my mind as the stories come to life, dancing behind my eyelids. I do hope your eyelids are attached for that, frozen underscore chaos. And I do like to pride myself in picking out rather solid stories from the vast selection available from the creepypasta sites I peruse. And, of course, excellent selections from Lovecraft and future authors will be used as well. Oh, next one, next one. <clears throat> Chilly and well produced by Don Ed Tech. <clears throat> I have long drives and the stories are keeping me entertained. The narration is great, the production value is high, and the stories are creepy. Keep up the good work. High production values. Hmm. Well, between you and me, Don Ed Tech, and everyone else that's listening, um, <clears throat> I operate on a fake it till you make it philosophy. <laughs> well, thank you, Frozen underscore Chaos and Don Ed Tech. It warms the cockles of my cold, twisted heart to hear such kind words and genuine flattery. Remind me to visit you and thank you personally. In your dreams, of course. <laughs> well, that is all for tonight, kitties. Alas, my friends, the time has come. Though our story is not quite done. I must away, so enjoy your stay. For you shan't leave. Till we finish this one. <laughs> Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams. The Mad Catter Presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2016 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or their simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade, and you can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time.
Support Twisted Tea Time by subscribing to us on Patreon at patreon.com slash themadcatter. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com, as well as Jason White, whose work can be found at soundcloud.com slash angels dash of dash despair. Details can be found in the show notes. If you want more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com slash Cheshire Hat or on Twitter at RealMadCatter. Download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hat or visit me at www.themadcatter.net. Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams. <laughs>